Okay, good morning. We are recording. You know what you should do, Patrick, because you look smaller than me, even though you're so much taller than me? You should just come a little bit close. Scooch yourself and your mic closer to the camera a little bit. No, he's refusing. <laughs> okay. When you look Wait, at the what? image and you see me towering over you. <laughs> well, people know it's, annoyed. An, they'll know it's an illusion now. Okay, okay. Again, we are in the same room, <laughs> even though this split screen looks like we could be across the world from each other. And it is Tuesday, the uh, it's 13th of October. <laughs> oh, it's not Halloween, is it? No. I, anyway, I, I thought we would, <laughs> we should talk today about. Well, uh, we got, because we got, we got a little comment, right? So I mean, our last episode was on criticism. And then someone said, I, I consider the like recommendations of what we should talk about to be a kind of criticism, mm -hmm. like a kind of familial friendly one right yeah but someone wrote us and said talk about uh privilege and the responsibility that comes with it and i i found that a very compelling request because it goes into areas of both the kind of politics of of uh of privilege and economics and and also into deep philosophical issues of of free will versus determinism and I think we can dive into privilege, responsibility, and free will. Those are the three kind of things. Again, we don't really plan this. This was just like a, a, a three-second <coughs> conversation we had last night about maybe this is what we should talk about this morning. So bear with us. Um, I, I think one of the beauties of this is that we're, we're as surprised as anyone else at how this comes out, even though it does add a certain ad hocness to the proceedings right right do you feel responsible for your actions patrick and does your study of neuroscience inform that feeling at all um yeah i feel quite responsible for my actions i i find it difficult to unpack the why <clears throat> if you're doing like a forensic analysis of your own actions but i mean even even i feel like the we have a privilege to spend an hour every morning doing this. You know, we're not, we're not taking care of four kids on our way on a bus on the way to, you know, our second job kind of thing. Like we have the privilege to sit and have this kind of luxurious hour where we think and talk and smile and laugh and, you know, talk about things that interest us rather than, rather than kind of the emergency responses to logistics or scenarios <clears throat> or other people. Our, our, our favorite uh, critic that we love to poke fun of, uh, Emily, uh, she always goes, ah, free will philosophers, they're just these privileged people who have the time to think about this bullshit, right? And I, <laughs> sorry, Emily, yeah. for the impression, but I never thought of the politics of the, of, of the, of the ability to even think about the free will issue. I think there's a deeper issue there that shouldn't be dismissed, that we do have a fundamentally contradictory two possibilities. Either things are caused by the laws of physics or things that precede our existence or are uh, fundamentally outside of us, or there's some way in which we are the origin of our actions. And those views are, to me, and in ways that we can unpack over the next hour, equally incoherent and equally frustrating for their own reasons. And I do think there's something to, obviously this is like, you know, taken over the minds of philosophers for millennia, but I, it never occurred to me that even the whole undertaking of thinking about it is a uh, reflection of deep privilege and that it's just like these white male philosophers who are sitting in the comfort of the uh, halls of academia contemplating this stuff instead of worrying about things that actually we need to worry about. So I want to go down both yeah, these sure. paths, or actually all four of these paths, right? Sure, um, sure, sure. Uh, so ahead. first of all, Emily would never listen to this, so we don't have to apologize. <laughs> it's way below her discernment threshold. Uh, and yeah, I mean, <clears throat> like the moral layer that gets added on is is in some sense extraneous the moral layer of like the shoulds and the oughts uh uh is to me extraneous to 
the thing I like to fundamentally think about is, which is just like, why do we do the things that we do and are we responsible for them? And do we have access to the reasons we do them? So this is why I went and studied mind control parasites because it flips a preference in a mouse instead of being afraid of cat to being attracted to a cat. And to me what was interesting about that was a cat or a mouse behaves and it behaves in a certain way and you watch it behave. And, you know, if you could like ask the mouse to introspect a little bit, like, why did you just approach that cat? Why didn't you run away? It would have no introspective access to the fact that some little parasite somewhere in its hypothalamus or amygdala was maybe skewing some innate, you know, reproduction or defensive pathway to make it. More worryingly, it could have some post hoc explanation that wasn't actually true if you, you, the neuroscientist, would know that and the mouse wouldn't, right? Right, right. And so, and so I I think this, to bring it back to privilege, I think there's a way to think about kinds of privilege and I'm, and I'm being intentionally broad here as a kind of freedom of movement. So we, we talk about in a, we, this isn't me, there's like degrees of freedom of the hand. Do you know this or degrees of freedom just in general, like the, the amount of optionality you have, the amount of directions or paths you can move. And people talk about, I think about it most strongly with degrees of freedom of the hand, the human hand. So the human hand, we have like so many joints and wrists we have, like we're highly articulated. And so we ask ourselves, like, why are humans special? What is it? What is it about us that gave us maybe cognition or is unique to us across the animal kingdom? And we have the highest degree of articulation in our hands. Our degrees of freedom are the most. Like if you add the wrist and the elbow and all the joints and the opposable thumb, we can do the most amount of things with our hands. And I think of privilege, social privilege, demographic privilege, like financial privilege as actually quite similar as you have the most degrees of freedom. And you you like just socially, just in your behavior, you can do a lot. You can, you know, a parking ticket or getting your car towed is not going to ruin your day. You're not going to lose your job because you couldn't get to work on time because your car got towed. You just hop in a, you know, black car or you, you have someone pick you up like that kind of privilege. And it can extend. It doesn't have to be necessarily even financial, right? Like now we kind of have this thing where we have gig labor economy for like what used to be exclusive services to the upper class like a car that just comes and picks you up food delivery, like cooks and things cell like phones. This. Yeah. Cell phones. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Gordon Gecko, like just walking yeah. down the beach with the Used phone to be there. <laughs> was just this, like you could feel the power that came with that. Like a satellite dedicated just to his conversation. And, and then you could, this, this is just the scene of him walking on the beach in the movie wall street with the phone in his hand, which was this brick was this all, it was like this, almost this visceral feeling of power that came with that. And now I'm think about the fact that so often we pick up our phones against our own free will in so far as it might even exist. Like how the difference between compulsively picking up when what I want more than anything, if I want to exert, if I could exert my free will would be to practice my piano. And instead I look at my Instagram, right? Like there, I feel like the phone is removing my degrees of freedom in a really deep and unsettling way, right? So I do these strange thought experiments. um, I sometimes with myself, I think just to pass the time. One of them is is usually like, if I'm in a room full of people, I think to myself, um, and I I think as like a writer or a journalist, because I have a journalist side, like who is the most interesting person in this room on a journalistic level? Another one I think of is if I'm in a new town, I think who knows this town the best? So I was in some small like peninsular town in Belize, once and i was thinking like who understands on a fundamental level the like operations of this town like is it the police chief is it the mob boss is it the drug dealer like is it the real estate baron who's known a lot is it just like the 12 year old kid who's never left who's like just been watching and never said a word like i don't know who gets it the best and and a third one of these is i i imagine a heat map of a city and every single person has a different heat map And so heat map, like different colors for different buildings and different spots. And the only thing this heat map is about is for every single individual, what do you have access to in a city? Like what buildings can you go into and not be kind of kicked out or arrested? Right. And just literally each person has their own heat map. And as awkward as it is to admit, like attractive people will have different heat maps than unattractive people. Rich people will have different heat maps than non-rich people. Like Homeless people get kicked out of every, you know, they will try to walk into any commercial establishment, they get kicked out. I can walk into any commercial establishment, they won't kick me out. Like, that's just awkward, but it's true. Um, there's, you're going to get racism, you're going to get classism, you're going to get everything at once. 
And I was thinking like, okay, who is the person or what kind of person has the most access, right? Who has the most full heat map, the widest heat map to a given city? Just imagine San Francisco or Los Angeles, who can get into most? Celebrities will actually have one. You, a celebrity could knock on a door and probably get invited into some homes or always be allowed into certain places. Although then it be, for a celebrity, having been married to one, like it becomes the opposite. They could become so crippled by the, the recognition recognizability that right. they can no longer move around anymore and they start to feel deeply depressed about not being able to go have the freedom they used to have well to they just walk outside they have the freedom they just don't like the consequences of that like like they, I, i'm not saying on the I heat know. map it's you like you have to be happy going to the place it's it's what do you have access you can to get mobbed by people and not like be able to just yeah it doesn't really count as going into a place if you're just gonna okay, be like a accosted by every person you see that's fair and i guess it uh, like being surrounded by people does reduce your degrees of freedom because fundamentally Even physically yeah. yeah fundamentally this heat map is about the degrees of freedom right it's yeah. about how where can you go and when i remember michael jackson like rented out an entire mall for his birthday one year because he never had gone to a mall without getting mobbed and he just put his friends in it and it was like can we just have a normal like mall weekend wow <laughs> um and so i've been i've been thinking so for those of you listening in the future or the past to this, um, I've been thinking a lot about past. this quarantine year. I don't know. I just like <laughs> that, doing that. That posits a lot of freedom. <laughs> um, or future time travelers listen to this before it even <laughs> happened because they could reconstruct beforehand. Never presume. What we're going to say. My, the the, the harshest on... criticism my publisher ever gave me was that I presume too much. Um, and so I, I'm not presuming anymore. I will remove that from my, my thought patterns. Um, uh, so this is in the middle of the, pandemic right this is 2020 we're in quarantine uh and i have been thinking about how interesting quarantine is in terms of degrees of freedom and the restriction on degrees of freedom and one of the things that i think people are their bodies are rejecting and their minds are rejecting about this year without even maybe being able to explicitly like figure out why is the uh, like there's a there's a restriction on movement and there's there's like a very clear explicit restriction on movement and there's a very clear explicit restriction on your degrees of freedoms in social circles and all these kinds of things and what i find so interesting about it is that i think it mimics on some level poverty i think i think i think it mimics a lack of privilege for example like the airlines were shut down for a while right people didn't fly if you were poor the airlines have been effectively functionally shut down for you for the entirety of the time you were poor. Like you could never go on the airline. Like it existed and it flew around, but you couldn't go on it. Right. Your degrees of freedom, you're, you're, you were limited, right? And there's this way in which like, uh, uh, I have a friend who once described to me poverty as a lack of redundancy, which is to say if anything goes wrong along the chain, the causal chain of your day, uh, any one thing goes wrong, everything downstream of that will be affected. Yeah. And that is a, restriction in degrees of freedom. And so I think there's this intimate relationship between um, what privilege grants you on all the different kinds. Sometimes you can be you can be extremely poor uh, and, you're, and your car breaks down on the way to work, but if you have a social circle, if you have friends, if you have a friend that can come get you, that's a kind of privilege. It's, it's earned, it's yeah. deserved as many are, but like it's a kind of privilege. So it's not just about a kind of financial uh, redundancy, but just like a, it can be social, it can be spiritual, it can be emotional, it can be whatever. But, but there's there's this sense in which like every single linkage in the chain is not as essential. So I think what we mean on the other side of that coin, what possibly what we mean by free freedom is uh, an excess of redundancy. So uh, and a richness of causes. So uh, so, for example, if I were to like probe your brain and make you lift your arm up, that would be a very simple, unredundant cause. Right. It would be a very. Uh, it just have this one basic mechanical cause. If, on the other hand, you say I'm going to lift my arm to illustrate uh, uh, the example, the the you know everything that we're talking about right now, there's a wealth of causes I bring to that. My education and my uh, uh, you know uh, the, the way I'm bringing to bear everything we're talking about, and I'm lifting my arm as an example of that. There's a there's a redundancy of causes there. It seems like I'm, I'm thinking this out loud right now, but it seems like, insofar as we define lack of freedom as a lack of redundancy, we could define freedom as there being a wealth of 
of causes and therefore possibilities, right? I could, in you could imagine a world in which I didn't lift my arm and I used some other example, I lifted the banana, right? Um, and, and it does seem that we, the, the very idea of freedom depends on just a more complex system. So uh, you can imagine a very basic chess program. Imagine the first chess program ever written that only knew how to make one move in response. Like it just like knew that the first move it's going to make is like, yeah. to, you know, pawn to e4 or whatever. And then the second move was another, and it was just a, a series of legal moves that if you played the chess program a few times, you realize that it just made the same moves all the time. That would be a chess program with very little free will, right? Mm -hmm. Nowadays, if you put a very complex program against another complex program, it's going to play a different game each time. What does it mean that it has all these possibilities, that it's looking deeper into the game and it's considering many different options, right? It seems like it has, it's not... It's not just being caught. And, and also, we have to distinguish between the moves that are open to it and the ones that aren't, the ones that are illegal in the game of chess, right? It's, those aren't within its degrees of freedom because it would no longer be playing chess if it were to make a move that wasn't technically allowed, right? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just, I've always wondered what does it, what does it even mean to be free, right? Like, obviously, you don't want to say that the choice is divorced from all the things that made you who you are, right? Because then you then that would also be some, somehow not free. It would just feel random, right? Like when you say, I'm, I have the, the freedom to choose the red socks or the blue socks in the morning. And then you say, well, why do you choose the red ones? Because I like red better. And they say, well, did you choose to like red better? Yes. Why? Because it reminds me of, you know, the, you know, certain things from my childhood that I liked, you know, like toys and stuff like that. And then there's a, there's a point where you say, well, it becomes incoherent because at some point those causes have to reach before you. Right. Yeah. And then the freedom disappears again. So it's this elusive thing that kind of comes. And if you think about it too deeply, it becomes incoherent. And I think my favorite response to the free will question was just this kind of pithy, like flippant remark by Christopher Hitchens. They asked him like, do you believe in free will? And he said, of course I have no choice. And so there's a certain degree where you have to believe in it because the belief itself also is a cause, right? Because if you, if you believed you had no free will, maybe you would just sit on the couch all day long. So maybe it's just a necessary evolutionary illusion that we have in order to make us act at all, right? Anyway, lots to unpack here. Uh, uh, there's, you know, edge.org. No. Have you heard of this? It's like a, I guess it's a magazine. I don't know what the hell it is, but they ask, they ask like a bunch of academics, like one single question every year. And then you get a, but you get hundreds of kind of like, uh, academic responses and there's some artists thrown in things like that. Um, and one of the, it, but it tends to, it, it, it skews scientific and philosophical. And one of the years, the question was, what do you think about machines that think? Mm -hmm. And, uh, my PhD advisor, uh, Tsibolsky, I loved it. Everyone gave these like long essays. Everyone, everyone used it as a, like an open invitation to write like a thousand words or 2000 words about what does it mean to be an automaton? What does it mean to, to, to in, engage in free will? Like, what is the difference? All these things. And his, his response, it was just this pithy one line thing that was just like, I don't know. Why don't you ask them? Um, which he meant like, just go out and ask the people because they're just a, like, just ask each other because uh -huh. it's us. We are the automatons. We already are machines that think, right? And and he so he completely believes that um, you're reduced down to your biology and we just simply don't know enough to understand why it is that you did the thing that you do or why it is that your preferences are for red and not the blue sock, but that fundamentally there is a physical explanation. Uh, but the question is, is the physical explanation compatible with also a richer explanation? There seems to be... A physical explanation is never going to be count as a satisfying explanation for most things that we think about. So, if even if the if the physical explanation is true, it's deeply uh, empty compared to a, 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 a an explanation that we would count as uh, being meaningful and helpful. I don't. I don't think there's any phenomenon across all of science, across the history of science, across the history of observation. That has not ultimately, when it gets explained, been explained by the, it, the its constituent parts and its physical parts underlying it. So I, I guess I, I kind of believe that at some point we might 
encounter a physical description of the brain as well. There just has yet to be one. There can be a, there can be things that are unexplained, but there has yet to be one that is not a product of its physical substrate. It across all of physics, across all of astronomy, across all of everything. And and I just I just think I just don't know if it would count as an explanation. You you I could give you a very very correct and accurate explanation of uh you know uttering the sound patrick right and that's still you know and you could explain what what processes did that and what the sound waves come out and everything but without you know knowing you and 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 the whole context of an, another human and having a name and all of that stuff the physical explanation is just deeply unhelpful so what right what, what about so on the responsibility side of this um i was once asked so there's kind of a law and neuroscience group that i was in and i was once asked um, <clears throat> a thought experiment someone was working on a capital punishment case and there's a thought experiment about um the person had tested positive so i think i think the person was up for capital punishment so death penalty mm -hmm. and they had tested positive for the parasite that i studied the toxoplasma that got into their brain right or gets into some people who are infected's brain and uh, they asked just like, okay, in the capital punishment side of things, like right before you know, the, the, the kind of evidentiary standard changes, they kind of allow more, uh, less convincing evidence just because someone's life is on the line. So they said, okay, this person tested positive. They have a blood test. They have antibodies for the parasite. Um, do you think you could go in and say something about whether or not that shaped their uh, criminal act? Right? which is to say like we know that the parasite or there had been some evidence that the parasite increases testosterone, maybe makes you more aggressive, maybe makes some male species more aggressive, maybe makes you more likely to engage in risky behavior. And would I go up on the stand and say this parasite, because this person has it, uh, influenced their actions? Right. This is about privilege. It's about responsibility. It's about degrees of freedom because this parasite would be reducing their degrees of freedom when and if they like had a gun and pointed it at someone. The idea is that the parasite maybe shifted them slightly above the threshold of pulling the trigger, whereas otherwise, if they had, did not have it, they would not have pulled the trigger. It's a reduction in the optionality of their choices. And for, I, I like I found the question so inherently fascinating, but I gave like an epidemiological, I gave like a correct epidemiological answer, which is we actually have no evidence that just because you test positive for it, the thing is in your brain. Even if it was in your brain, we have no idea where in your brain it would be. And even if it, we knew where it was in the brain, we have no actual functional explanation for how, why, or to what degree it will change a person's behavior. I mean, that's the real answer, right? But the, but the fundamental question about to what degree was this person responsible for their own actions? Like the law has to deal with this so often when it's like, is it childhood trauma? People bring up sex abuse all the time Yeah. Uh, in terms of like their adult behaviors that gets used as evidence. Is it childhood trauma? Is it socioeconomic? Is it demographic? Is it, they, you know, like, and each of these is a kind of thing. It's like the external world impinging on a psyche and a person that accumulates into the thing that they did that they're they're kind of on on trial for and then the question is does does a belief then in less free will make you more forgiving does it make you give you a more forgiving disposition because you would think that and and it is a more it seems to me that a more liberal uh or progressive worldview tends to look at this more expansive view of causation right and therefore be more forgiving of the individual um, uh, so I, does forgiveness require a, a, a belief in a, a, a less belief in responsibility? So it, it's interesting. Uh, I, in interpersonal relationships, have, as I think more and more about the inability for people to describe their own reasons, uh, just for like, why did you do the thing that you did? Mm -hmm. I found myself kind of like waxing and waning between thinking, oh, well, the reason I'm getting, it, it was, it's almost like destabilizing. Because it's like, oh, the re I know that the reason I'm getting is not true uh -huh. or it's not fully true. Right. And then that, that's a kind of insidious thing to like let grow this idea that, OK, the, the, the thing that is being told to you and the thing that you are telling about your behavior and your own actions is not entirely true. Um, and then you and then I kind of go back and forth between thinking that and in some sense, excusing that. Right. Because it's like, OK, well, we just don't know. It's not it's not an a, a intentional misdirection. It's just simply that we do not have access to those parts of ourselves. 
Uh, but then I think to myself, like, well, in what world should we then, given that we know this, do our best to come up with a kind of suite of answers or multiple answers, all of which might be true or are closest to the truth? Like, to what degree do we owe a person, a partner, a, I guess, a prosecutor, you know, like the police investigator, to what degree do we owe all of the plausible explanations rather than just a single attempt at a single explanation? And and it's a, it's extremely tricky. And I think about it all the time. And I do think this is one of the more, like the inability of language and the, the, the rise of confabulation um, to, to give accurate answers to things is like probably the root cause of maybe like I don't know, 40 to 60% of social, social stress and like social miscommunication. I kind of think people, you know, it's just, we're not getting, we're not getting the real answers. Or yeah. Or we have to accept that there are different types and layers of real answers. Right. Right. Well, but then they're compatible with each other. Well, there there could be a neurological explanation as well as a moral explanation that that is presumed some sort of like responsibility and those can coexist and i think that we have to it's like a deep question is can we have these levels of explanation are they compatible with each other and then just to give a little background philosophically like you have uh free will is often uh juxtaposed against determinism right so either maybe we live in a universe that's fully governed by the laws of physics and these laws only allow things to happen one way right and then that's called determinism. And then you could say, well, maybe determinism isn't determinism isn't true. Uh, maybe quantum physics or something tells us something that the world could go different ways. And then you'd have indeterminism. But you could also have indeterminism and still believe that free will is not possible. Um, and anyway, you people can look these different views up. But you have then you have people to say, well, determinism is true, and we have free will, and that's called compatibilism. And you can say like. The only thing that depends on that the compatibilism depends on is that you could have done differently. But what that even means to me is very difficult to wrap my head around. Like things never has happened differently than they did. So what does it mean that they could have gone differently? Um, that's just a, a trick that our mind seems to have, right? And and in that, <clears throat> to go back to the like kind of, I think the social heart of the commenter's question on you know, privilege and responsibility. Like, do you think that excuses responsibility when granted privilege? If, 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 you know, we're talking about these kinds of free will and we're kind of, I feel like we're moving towards a maybe more deterministic worldview, you know, in its extreme, uh, you are not responsible for using privilege for good or using right. right? And, and, but that feels fundamentally like troubling. Uh, well, we can't have morality or responsibility without some sense of free will. There, there does, this is where I get annoyed if people say that's not an important debate. It goes, it it impinges deeply on all of these very, very real and practical issues. If you don't, if you believe in a deterministic universe governed by the laws of physics that couldn't be otherwise, there is no sense in which you can assign more responsibility. I think that's just yeah. a, a, a plain fact. You have to believe that in some sense you a person is the cause of their actions and that those actions could have been different and that that there's some sense in which they had a moral choice and so like it's a deeply ethical uh issue and and religion you know uh, depends on it and uh and 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 for me it's hard because we do feel like in some sense we do have a a a, a a choice in the way we act and we also if we think really deeply about it i mean like sam harris says that not only is free will an illusion but even the illusion of free will is an illusion because if you really think about and observe your actions in a meditative state for example you realize that you're as surprised as the next person as the, the way your thoughts come out what you think of next um so not even we don't even have the illusion of free will. If you just look deeply enough, you feel like life just happens to you. Your thoughts just happen. They just pop up, right? Like, and I think that's a, there's a pretty strong case for that. And I'm just, I, I ping pong back and forth between, cause then like, uh, I think John Searle said the, 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 the not believing in free will, uh, 
point of view is equally incoherent because like if you say if the waiter comes up to you and says would you like the uh the fries or the salad with that and you'd said uh the word the universe is determined i don't i don't there's no point in me choosing that in itself was a choice to say that so you're you're actually constantly choosing you have no possibility of not choosing in that case you you even not choosing is in itself a choice so we're we're both like compelled to believe and not believe in this and that's just like drives a mind like mine crazy on a, you know i think about this more than you would, <laughs> more than you imagine like it's like constantly troubling me and it's probably that's probably a, a reflection of my but white you privilege be, you choose to be constantly troubled by no <laughs> i wish i could figure it out for fuck's sake um but i uh and 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 maybe that is a reflection of my privilege that if i was that if i was worrying about the four kids which i chose not to have um you know and 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 all of the responsibilities that people have that don't have the the the, the privilege to think about these you know meandering philosophical irres- unresolvable issues maybe it is a reflection of that in which case i'm i have no choice but to think about it i don't know so i want to ask uh after this remind me that like i think we should talk about if we can remember uh like times recently or this year where privilege has aided us right like well, you like, told me to remind you to tell me about vasodilation i just remembered that oh yeah yeah <laughs> that was days ago about something else <laughs> <laughs> if it fits into our conversation by any chance <laughs> and uh Go on. Um, so so uh, there's this video online. I forget where I saw it, but uh, it's a it's a short video about. Um, so basically, there's 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 there are. How do I say this? Let's see. Okay, so imagine the projects. It's a it's a building in the projects, right? And there's a bunch of African American teens. Uh, they're sitting kind of around on the porch. And uh, there's a pizza delivery man. And and I think I got most of these details right. This pizza delivery man comes up and uh, also African-American and uh, is delivering the pizza. At some point, I don't remember the dialogue, but I think the group of teens, they kind of just like leave the pizza. Just like, we're not going to pay you, but to leave the pizza, right? Uh, Effectively robbing the pizza delivery man. And the pizza delivery man then pulls out a gun and proceeds to rob them because i you know my my interpretation was just out of like are you kidding me you're gonna you're gonna take my tip you know just like uh, just this kind of a grievance and the thing that i noticed uh was kind of a lot of motion at first amongst the group um uh, uh that were sitting on the the stoop the porch right they're just kind of like moving around ambling around like active energetic teenagers and when the gun is pulled on them everybody freezes Right. And the thing that struck me about that amongst, uh, you know, besides the like deep sadness of the, just the situation, um, was when a gun is held to your, to you, when a gun is pointed at you, your immediate, the immediate like bodily reaction is a restriction on your degrees of freedom is a restriction on your movement. And it struck me that what they were exchanging was kinds of poverty it struck me that what they were exchanging was kinds of quarantine. Like I'm going to restrict your, I'm not going to pay you. I'm going to rob you pizza delivery man, which is going to restrict your financial freedom, which is going to remove money from you, which actually ultimately ends up reducing your privilege and reducing your movement. The pizza delivery man responded by pulling out a gun and saying, "Yo, yeah, you're going to, you're going to reduce my movement. I'm going to reduce your movement. And it's like, I think there's this interesting way in which I think true pro, true, true, true poverty is kind of like you're in emergency mode at all times. And you're only thinking about, we're talking about degrees of freedom of movement, but I think, uh, I think we can also be talking about degrees of freedom of thought, right? When we're talking about the privilege to be able to, you know, meander about free will, it's a degree of freedom of thought. It's, it's a space in which we can move. It's the heat map of a city of thought, right? We have more access to be able to, uh, uh, talk about more things. And, there's something with poverty in particular where you just have to get to the next day. You just have to get through the week. You just have to figure out a way to survive till tomorrow. When those kids had a gun pulled on them, they just had to figure out how to survive a few seconds. It's extreme poverty, right? 
Having a gun held to you is ex you are not afraid. You are poor in that moment. Your degrees of freedom are reduced to a circle that, you know, a, hopefully not a chalk line, but like a very tiny circle around your immediate physical presence. And I find, I find it so interesting that like the way that people have described their resistance to quarantine, it feels like what they're actually resisting is this imposition of poverty on them. Yeah. The gun is being held to all of our heads. It's a tiny little virus of a gun, but it's a yeah. gun. I mean, those the bullets or whatever, you know, extend your metaphor as you will. But like effectively we have a gun to our heads and we're all responding to emergency in a different way. So, so, so you must accept though that like a, a physical explanation I feel like already the the parasite explanation is already a few levels up. Let's just go all the way down to basic, you know, laws of physics explanation of like the person pulling that gun. It exists and yet it will never in a million years get at the sociological explanation that you just gave about that involves poverty and and human beings living in projects and all of this kind of stuff like I just think we have to accept that there's there's l levels of explanation that offer different solutions to different problems and 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 giving if you said why did he pull out the gun on the pizza delivery man and you gave an equation there's just no way that that even counts as an explanation that would in any way matter to to what you're talking about yeah even though it's true to matter to the scale of that story right so we yeah, have to yeah, believe true. we have to have like emergent explanations that are equally true and it seems like freedom and responsibility exist in that way like they exist within a certain level of of uh intelligibility right i mean you you can have air particles trapped in a jar and try to describe the motion and the velocity and the position of each of the air particles right mm -hmm. and then the turbulence inside as you like shake it up mm -hmm. um but and then you have a plane that's trying to fly and Boeing engineers probably spend a little bit of time on the turbulence of the air, you know, mapping the air or whatever. But then there are some that don't have to think about that at all and just think about the lift on the wing or, you know, and just engineering the plane itself. And so it's, even though they're dealing with the same, they're dealing with fundamentally what is the same interaction. Uh, there's different scales of explanation. And then maybe someone else, you can imagine like a professional golfer who's like tosses a little blade of grass up into the air and to try to determine the wind direction, you know, they're technically interacting with the turbulence of the particles that are trapped in that same jar, but they don't need the physical description of the turbulence and molecules of air in the jar. They just want to know approximately which direction the wind is going in. Right. So, but that doesn't mean that the golfer who is looking for wind speed, um, is removed from the underlying physical description. It just means they choose not to care about it at that at that moment. So yes, there is a sociological explanation for projects and demographics and these kids and what they're doing and why they did what they did. But fundamentally, they're still dealing with fight or flight responses that are hormonally driven, you know, that are activated by the hypothalamus. You know, there there is a air molecule caught in a jar explanation that is still relevant, even if you choose to ignore, I think, most of the scales. Yeah, but I think what matters to us as human beings is dependent on the type of explanation we're looking to give. And to, to for the scientists to think that their explanation, because it's like exists on that molecular mathematical level, for it to be somehow a more true explanation is an arrogance that I think is unjustified. What was it? What was the insult? That <laughs> undeserved. <laughs> An undeserved arrogance. Yes, it's happening. Yes, it's true. Whether it counts it sh or it should count as the most true or the most useful explanation, that should be up for debate, I think. And whether you choose to dedicate your life to providing you know, moral explanations or mathematical explanations, I think there's room for luckily there's a the world is rich enough that and and we are receptive enough as human beings to be able to listen to both of these explanations and have them provide a, a different type of illumination of, of, as to what's going on but yeah. to say that one is incompatible with the other or one is more fundamental obviously it's more fundamental but then uh but that doesn't necessarily mean more true i think or maybe it does I don't know. I was I was reading about um, um, Bertrand Russell's uh, neutral monism the other day. So um, 
what kinds of stuff fundamentally does is the universe made up of, right? And so you, some people have said it's all mental things, and they're called idealists, right? And then there's some people who say it's all physical stuff, and they're called materialists or physicalists, right? And then you have the the problem of like, well, how does the physical explain the mental, and vice versa, right? So then you have dualists who say, well, they they both exist, and they're separate things. And then you have people who I learned just the other day that, like Bertrand Russell, who believe that there is one kind of stuff, but we don't know what kind of stuff it is. And it has exhibits both physical and mental qualities, right? And when you look at it from the outside, you have physical explanations make sense. And when you look at it from the inside, you have intrinsic or mental explana- uh, uh, qualities that they have, right? And that when the physicist gives a mathematical explanation of things than the way they move around. It's not because they know so much. It's because they know so little. All they can do is describe the way that the, uh, that, that the stuff that we don't know what it is moves around. And it relates to other such stuff that we also don't understand, right? And so, but if unless you believe in intrinsic qualities, then what is it that you're actually describing relationships between we don't know. And it's that seems to kind of jibe with this idea that when we do look all the way down at these fundamental particles, we don't even know what it means for them to exist or whether it means where, where they are or what they are. And, um, we, you know, it's, it's, it, we've come a long way from Newtonian mechanics that thinks that there's just like this, these, this stuff we don't as someone i as someone i uh, recently like a scientist that was being interviewed on a podcast they said are you a physicalist and he said yes with the caveat that we have no idea what physical stuff actually is or what that means so i think uh, um anyway enough <laughs> i'm gonna just let that thought ram- rambling just stop right now but we infer that it does matter i mean i mean so so like what is mind it doesn't matter what is matter never mind well like i mean I don't know why I'm thinking about golf, but like you throw, you throw the blade of grass to determine the wind speed because you know, the wind speed will shape the trajectory of the ball a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. We don't know what's in. Why we play golf is not, there's no reason to do that (laughs) because my mom thought my dad would want me to have learned how to play golf is the answer. Is that in the equations? Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, like if you do it, it has to be somewhere in there. The yeah. fact that I can conjure that reason means that it's a physical memory. It's a thing. It's a reason. It's a it's a it's a thought yeah. that is in my brain that I can conjure, or that gets conjured when it's kind of, you know, starts to think about golf or gets shaped by this sport or this idea, right? Like, I mean, I I think an interesting way to think about there there are some people that have started modeling thoughts as almost they're thoughts as almost like a streaming river across a topography of like a landscape. So like the idea being uh, not just that the stream of consciousness kind of cute metaphor is true, but just simply that um, at a given time point, like very, very shortly after you're thinking a thing. So right now we're right now we are just here and in T plus one, like in 500 milliseconds, we'll be somewhere else. Our thoughts will be somewhere else. And the question is, if they were completely uncorrelated and it was completely random, uh, there'd be no connection between your thoughts now and your thoughts one second later or half a second later. It would just kind of like successively at the rate and speed of thoughts, they would just change. But there does seem to be a continuation. There seems to be when you're in a thought kind of space, when you're in the terrain of, for example, golf, I then am able to conjure the thoughts about the reasons why I might have learned how to play when I was three for no good reason whatsoever. Um, And that there is an actual trajectory to thoughts as they navigate this kind of actual kind of physical space. And that it's, it's very similar to a, a lava flow or a river flow. And that when you are in there and you're kind of like, what does it mean to be able to reshape the context in which you're thinking about something? What does it mean to go in and, I don't know, like heal. Uh, It means that every time up until now, let's say healing from a trauma, that when the thoughts started streaming into the place that was about to be a bad place, you've basically set up like a physical dam to redirect and redistribute the thoughts around that, that kind of physical topography. And I mean, this is a, 
it's an, it's an interesting, I, th- I find it quite compelling and interesting and, but people are starting to put like math to these ideas. And the, the coolest part is that you should be hypothetically able to predict where thoughts will go, spontaneous thoughts as they occur in the day. You should, by virtue of knowing where they are now and the topography of the kind of like thought landscape, predict where they will be soon. And then the fact that they can look inside your brain and tell you which which choice you're going to make. There's the famous like neuro, neurological experiment recently done, right, where they can predict what choice you will make before you yourself think you've made a choice. So if you have to choose between the red and the blue and they tell you to hit a button once you've picked, I think what, like a long period before you pick, they can tell you which one the brain scanner can tell you which one you're going to choose. Is that correct? And do you have thoughts on the philosophical implications of that experiment? I know that that paper came out. Um, uh, that doesn't mean anything about its <laughs> anything about its truth or its veracity. Um, as soon as I read that, I just thought, okay, great. I'm sure that's a statistical error, um, and I'm going to just let other people figure out how to debunk it. And oh, like, you think it's just that well. Years no way. later, they did right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, if we're talking about the same one, I honestly never read it because okay. I didn't care because I knew it would just be proven untrue. And I'm sure it was a sampling error. Oh, how did you know this and, and why I, are you so uh, certain? I mean, I would love to be surprised. My certainty was just based on the, the kind of pure improbability of it being true. And, uh, and, and also Because the, of how little we actually understand of the brain. Yeah, well, and also the fact that there, there is a given odds to any single paper being true. Uh, one thing comes out. This is this is what news gets wrong. It's like one thing comes out. There's not a scientist in the world that thinks that that means that that is more than fifty percent true. It's just a thing that came out, and that in order for you, like, if you're trying to be discerning, and you're actually embedded in science and you're practicing science on a daily level, you don't. You know, these things are like nice hints. These are nice hints. Okay, at what but may do or may you not think theoret- Are you saying that theoretically, it's not possible for us to be able to predict which choice you make before you make the choice? Uh, but but the, there's a nuance to the way that it was framed, which is before the person realizes they made the choice. Yeah. So that has to like bubble up into consciousness. There are obviously sub and unconscious thoughts, decisions, and actions that are made pre-conscious, mm-hmm. like literally, etymologically, every every kind of e, and um. Like so, obviously there are there are many thoughts, there are many actions that we have that uh, we uh, are performed before they kind of make it into consciousness. So that's of no surprise whatsoever. Like mm-hmm. I'm not at all bothered by that. Okay. So the idea of so what was the part that wasn't that you knew wouldn't be true? That it was like multiple seconds before the person had, like it was before the, I I, I, just, I don't even want to speak about it because I don't remember the details. Okay. But it was just simply like it was an astonishingly early ability to predict when the person was going to do a thing. But but when you're in there in the weeds with statistics and experimental design and cohorts and the amount of people that are doing something and statistical power and everything, you can make a lot of stories true. And also a lot of stories like with, through no malice or ill will from the experimenter will just appear to be true from that one experiment that you did. You know, the uh, psychics for like the CIA and all kinds of places would study psychics for a bit, or at least according to John Ronson, right? Like the government was interested in psychic ability for a while because you can, if you take enough and the right kinds of statistical kind of observation, you can make it look like someone is able to predict something or someone knows something they don't actually know. And these were legitimate fields of study in like the 60s through the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And it just like, None of them hold up to population level statistics. None of them hold up. And so, yeah, another one comes along. Maybe there's some cycle at which they do. And I'm sure it is the case that milliseconds before an action, you'll be able to find traces of that in the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, but like it, there, there was some, some astonishingly uh, predictive amount of time in that paper. And I do recall uh, a more recent just takedown of the thing, which I knew would happen eventually. So I'd paid it no mind or attention. And then, so to, I want to go back to this idea of responsibility that comes with the privilege. It seems like we have, if you have more degrees of freedom, that comes with more degrees of responsibility, we hope, right? And that's what it means to be responsible. So, like, it does seem that there is, that privilege comes with power, comes with degrees of freedom comes with responsibility and I guess somebody who 
you know, somebody who would want people to recognize that and not waste that responsibility having conversations like this. <laughs> that's, why, that's why Emily criticizes the, uh, the free will philosophers, saying they have all this privilege, maybe they should be using it for good yeah, instead of yeah. like just wanking about this so this, what what could we have stuff, done right what could we have done with this hour instead of do this yeah we should have gone and uh, been helping people and 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 that's that's a deep question right it's nice to hear the encouragement of people saying oh like you know this morning somebody said oh that they, they're they like listening to this more than they're doing their school work and that you know i'd like that, to that think that we're, maybe we're harming the world <laughs> Oh, maybe it's better than it's a you know it's a type of school. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry for the people who are actually teaching useful things and actually know about these philosophical issues in ways that are, you know, we're being amateurs. That that also comes with, uh, you know, the the person who commits to not being an amateur, right? Who no longer who takes away their degrees of freedom. Let's say someone who who dedicates their life to playing music, they're going to remove the options of other things because they need to play their instrument eight to 10 hours a day and therefore provide the world with this astonishingly beautiful uh, act of playing. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are amateurs, which comes from amare, to love, right? Or dilettante, which comes from to delight in. And maybe they will never play at the level and they will never provide the world with that level of expertise right so in a way like i think people taking away their own free will or society taking away people's free will in order to like put them in this little box of what they do and therefore they do it better than everybody else versus somebody who goes out and is truly free and wanders and is curious and is like you know is that better for themselves and worse for society or do we want a society in which people are free to do many things and you know this is it comes to Again, it's a political question of like an authoritarian um, regime that decides for people what they should do versus a world in which people are allowed to their their minds and their bodies to wander. I think Bertrand Russell had a uh, a great book called In Praise of Idleness, where he advocated for a four hour work week so that people could have the time to pursue things that they actually loved instead of work right and now you have the same debate with universal basic income like saying let the machines right. do the work and let uh, let people have the uh, degrees of freedom to pursue things that aren't work and let give them the money and the and the and the possibility to do that and then it comes to this deep question of of of, of your view of human nature if, if it's allowed to be free will it flourish or should we be restricting and should we be doing that to ourselves? Because I think I find that when I'm too free, I do just fritter away the day, right? Like sometimes spending too much time doing things that I actually, on a larger scale, I'm not choosing. I just, uh, there's a following impulses. There's a baboon troop in Kenya who uh, ended up basically finding a tree of infinite resources, right? Like as a, as a kind of like non-linguistic primate running around Africa, mm -hmm. um, you're going to spend most of your day trying to find water, trying to find food, trying to like survive and try to avoid all the dangers and everything. And they just found this like perfectly safe Edenic, uh, like sit, like forest with all the food they could ever eat with no predators, no nothing. And so they effectively, and you know, they, they had to, uh, they could collect their food and their water within an hour in the morning and then be just fine. Right. Uh -huh. So the question is how do they fill the rest of their day? Right. They became extremely social. Uh -huh. They started just being nasty and awful to each other. Really? And they started dying of like cardiovascular disease and strokes and things that were downstream of social stress of just the, oh my God, 23 hours a day, we have to deal with other baboons. The hierarchy, the social stress of just like fritting about and like filling your time with unnecessary personal politics i wonder if this was a conservative scientist who like no. made this thesis no 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 it wasn't at all because then you have the the, the views of it's the bonobos about, it's not about us not everything's about us <laughs> it just is well no nothing just is i i disagree with that fundamentally like that whole explanation you gave depends on human values it it does compare the physiology of mortality to human style mortality 
Yeah, I mean, and you're describing even the primates as like you're give, anthropomorphizing them. They're just clusters of tetra of, of molecules floating around through space well, on some level. They're primate molecules. Nope. No, the whole level, the whole explanation of primate depends on 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 recognizing animals. And the reason we recognize animals is because probably evolutionarily we have to pick those out as like dangers to us. On some fundamental physical level, it's just the same type of fundamental particles bouncing around. Well, you can die from those fundamental particles if they clog your heart and arteries in cardiovascular disease. But the so. whole <laughs> idea of death is also a human construct. Sure. Right? Uh, Again, I, I'm going to call it's just, it a it's universal just, it's construct. Just, it's just, it's just, it's just um, remember that Jim Carrey thing? We're just clusters of tetrahedrons floating yeah. through space. <laughs> That's such a great clip. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen Jim Carrey, go on YouTube on the red carpet with the, you know, they, they ask him, why are you here at this fashion event? He said, I wanted to find the thing that least mattered on planet earth and come and do it. And like, he's like, what do you mean? These are icons. And he's like, what do you mean icons? He's like, we're just clusters of dodecahedrons floating through space. And that's all there is. Not, none of this matters. None of this exists. And I got to say, it sounds absurd. And he sounds like he's like on some weird, like manic depressive thing, but it's so true at the same time. I forgot that I had made a commitment to watch that every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you haven't. <laughs> I'm going to go watch it right now. Okay. All thanks, right. everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye.